If you haven't already, please also subscribe to us on Apple, Spreaker and Spotify. Just type in Brawl Boxing and you'll find us there. Thank you. Hello, folks, and welcome back to the Brawl Boxing Podcast. I'm Kieran McCourt, and I'm joined by co-hosts Colin McGuigan and Ram McLaughlin. I just want to start by giving a shout out to our amazing sponsor, CBD Uplift. They provide the best CBD products on the market, including oil, gummies and capsules. I've actually tried the products myself, and I can genuinely say they're the best CBD I've ever had, especially the gummies. I'd seriously recommend anyone. Um, if you use our discount code BRAWL20, you'll get 20% off and free shipping. So thanks a million, lads. Thanks for that, McCord. Great thanks to Wow Hydrate, who've sponsored the podcast. They've provided me and the lads with some of their protein and vitamin waters, along with their elect- electrolyte drinks, which are the best on the market. Thanks for your continued support. We really appreciate it. We're excited to announce joining us this week is former WBO Cruiserweight Champion Enzo Macronelli. Enzo, how are you doing, mate? Yeah, good, thanks. Thanks for inviting me on. No, Enzo, we really appreciate you coming on. We just want to take it back to the very start uh, when you were growing up. Um, were you always wanting to be a, a pro boxer or were you just knocking people out in the street and just thought, I can do this for a living? <laughs> no, I, uh, well, I pretty much didn't have a choice. My, um, my, dad, my dad pretty much had me to be a boxer. You know, that's, all, yeah. that's all he wanted. Is, uh, his pictures of me in the gym when I was three years old, hitting, hitting a bag. I was, uh, I was up in the gym. My dad is on amateur club I was up there now you know the older boys all give me a kick up the ass to doing it then uh, but I've always been around boxing um, I had my first fight at 10 knocked my first boy out at 12 knocked my first man out at 13 so I you know I, I knew I knew I had power from the very start but in in Wales because uh, obviously in Ireland there's a huge sort of boxing uh sort of background um and in wales there was that the boom with you and joe and gavin reese and yeah. stuff which we'll touch on later but for you growing up was was boxing a big thing in wales um if to be honest i, I don't really know it was, it was sort of i was stuck with, within the the welsh um club shows uh you know i didn't really venture over there then uh 1993 i had my first chance at the the nationals the abas which later become the four nations uh, we had to have four fights to get to the final, so um, I won the four fights, got to the final. And only, only my ninth fight, I won a, I won a national title, um, and it, it just kicked off from there. And I, I started going to uh, away England versus Ireland versus Scotland, um, and you know I just just enjoyed enjoyed fighting. But at what stage were you sort of thinking I could make a career out of this? Like like I could I could turn pro and when, when I'm when I'm honest, when I when I hit fourteen. Um, I was I was knocking kids cold, uh, and I, I no, I, I it was it was like fourteen years of age, giving away weight, giving away experience, and I was leaving them. I was leaving them cold. So for for obvious reasons, not not many wanted to touch me. No one, many wanted to go near me. You know, I, I was willing to take my dad was willing to take stupid fights, and boys boys a lot heavier than me just just to get me fights, but just no one would have a fight. So uh, I had two years out of the ring. Um, <laughs> Done what boys do up a park with girls, bottles of white cider, a bit, <laughs> bit of weed. Uh, just, just enjoyed myself. You know, that, that's as far as I went. Um, come to come about 16, um, my dad gave me a bit of a ball again. He said, What are you doing? He said, You still pop up the gym now and again. I was about, I was about 15 and a half, 16 stone at that time. Um, he said, you, you pop up the gym once a week. He said, You've got plenty of talent. You've got ferocious punch power. He said, What are you doing? And it, it was it was pretty much nastier than that. I was just uh, saying <laughs> this time. The PC. Uh, so, so we went to a club show. And I, I always helped my dad in the corner. I used, to, I used to do the corner with the kids when I was 15, 16. I was on matches shows. And we went to a club show and we met my dad met Nicky Piper. I don't know if you remember Nicky. Um, but Nicky was fighting Darius, Darius Mikulczewski for the light heavyweight world title. Uh so my dad said, oh, my boy, let's do a bit of sparring with you. And he said, oh, he's only 16. He said, we want, you know, pointless sparring. He said, no, oh, trust me, he'd be good. So we went up there. Um, I cut a long story short. Nicky thought that, Nicky thought he had the better of me. I don't think he did. Uh, <laughs> and it, it was a good spot. You know, I was 16 years of age. I was a chief sparring partner for someone fighting for the world title and more, more than holding my own. Was that when you first realised, yeah, that I, I, I'm going to be a world champion here? When, um, when I, was here? I, oh, I think I had my first fight about three weeks later. It was my first, my first senior fight. I'm boxing two and a half years. It was my first senior fight. Um, 
And the guy, Tony Williams, who was the show it was, he was matching the show. And he said, Mario, my dad's name was Mario. He said, Mario, I've got any open class elite heavyweights. He said, yeah, Enzo. He said, no, he said, I, I'm not for an open class elite heavyweight. He said, yeah, Enzo. He said, Mario, he hasn't fought for two years. Uh, this kid that has 27 fights, he's 125. He's open class. He's knocking everyone out. He said, yeah, Enzo fight him, no problem at all. So I, I was one of them. My dad told me I was fighting. I asked where. That was it. I didn't ask who. I didn't ask nothing. Uh, so we went went to the show and it was a it was a newspaper article and they had a write up. It was really good. They had a write up in each fight, and they had Enzo McCannelli, um, brilliant youngster, junior ABA champion, NABC champion, um, very, very stand up performer as a junior. Don't expect too much off him tonight. He's really up against it. You know, it's, it's going to be a really hard fight. I know he's going to give his all, but it's going to be a really hard fight. Get to the fight. The fight lasted one minute, 32 seconds. Uh, I knocked him spark cold. He was out, he was out 10 minutes on the floor. Um, so nice. that that point then, I, I knew I had a little something. Um, I ended up having seven, seven senior fights. That's all I had, seven senior fights. Uh, seven wins, seven knockouts. Uh, <laughs> six in the first round. I, I even give away, I even give away Eight stone once to a fight to a boxer super heavyweight, 23 and a half stone, knocked him out first round. Went to Scotland, fought the super heavyweight champion, and I was only a heavyweight and knocked him out first round. So I think then I knew I, I had a I had a little something. There must have been a serious, serious buzz around even the, the Welsh media, Joe, when you were doing that, because not a lot of people sort of when they go into like the pro game, like they sort of struggle, don't they? First off, and, and you're going mm. in knocking people out first round and all, and um, had an unbelievable start. Yeah, it was it was like uh, in the amateurs, I was I was just banging boys out with bigger gloves, you had bigger head guards. Uh, I think three times, three times the boy was out for more than ten minutes on the floor, and he was face first on the floor. Um, so I knew obviously knew I had power. Uh, I decided to turn pro. We were part of Wales at the time. We were part of a split federation. We were the WABA and the WABF. I was part of the WABF. Um, uh, the WABA was the only recognised boxing affiliation for the Commonwealth and the Olympics uh, and that sort of thing. So our ABF offered the ABA for a fight, uh, let's have a show, and whoever wins, all go. So we're taking the best team, but they didn't want none of it. You know, we had the likes of me, Bradley Price, Gavin Reese, you know, Jamie Arthur, who some really good boys. Uh, so I don't think they wanted to risk it. So I had an offer then um, off of someone, I can't remember the name, to join a WABA affiliated club uh, where I could get a chance to go to the Commonwealth and they were offering me, they were offering, offering me, I think something like £2,000 a month. Uh, at the time, 17 years of age, you know, that's, that's really good money. Uh, but it, it was my dad's club. I was never leaving my dad's club. Uh, so just decided to turn pro. I love the way, I love the way most people's parents are like, don't want their kids fighting or like protect them. And your dad's like, he'll fucking fight anyone. Oh, oh, we went to Scotland. I went to Scotland and we traveled seven and a half hours in a, in a minibus. Uh, guess the show, the heavyweight pulled out. They come in, they said, Oh, look, this heavyweight's pulled out, but we got the super heavyweight. Bear in mind that it was, I was 13 stone 10. Uh, the super heavyweight at the time for Scotland, I think he weighed 19 stone six. Uh, so they, the Welsh coaches said, no, nah, it's it. It's not. We're not having it. It's too much of a weight advantage. You're trying to pull a fast one on us. No way. So I, I pulled him. Roy, Roy Chambers, his name was. I pulled him. I said, "What do you mean I'm not fighting?" I said, "I've travelled seven hours in a fucking van. I can't. I can hardly fit in this minibus on the seats. You know, let me fight." He said, "Enzo." He said, "It's like five stone weight difference. It's nearly five stone weight difference. There's no way I'm allowing this." He said, "You're coaching. You're to, to back me up or uh, appeal to me." I, he said, who's your coach? I said, my dad's my coach. He said, right, I'm going to phone him now. I said, yeah, give him the number. So he had to go to a pay phone at the time. So he didn't have, uh, didn't have mobiles. So he had a pay phone. As soon as he went off the phone, I started getting changed. So I knew exactly what would happen. He said, <laughs> my dad said, he said, my dad said, does he want to fight? He went, yeah. He said, let him fight then. So I, I fought. Uh, the, only the only time I was ever scared, I boxed, when I, I told her I boxed about 23 stone, a, a boy called Darren Morgan. Uh, the beast of Bonnie Mine. He come and, he later come and join me. Uh, 
and he, he won a he won a Four Nations gold medal, super heavyweight, with the quickest knockout in Four Nations history. I think he knocked an Irish kid out in the final, as it happens. Um, but I boxed him. I got in the ring. I looked over this boy, twenty three stone. He, he, he was it was a small ring. I remember looking out the corner of my dad. I said, "What the fuck are you doing?" He went, ah, who, "Who be you like, boy? Who be you like?" And as it happens, Darren, Darren, come out. We started swinging. I just tucked up, tucked up, tucked up. He stopped. I shut my eyes. He went bang. I caught him. <laughs> and he, he broke me. He broke the board when I dropped him with his knee hit the floor. He oh broke the board God. as well. That is madness. I love your dad. If he had his way, you'd have been fighting for a world title in your debut, probably. <laughs> yeah, honestly, honest to God, he had he had so much faith in me. He was unbelievable. It was unbelievable. Oh, so here, so four fights in, you had what I can only sort of describe as like a, a slip up, like because you went eight years on beating after that. So, what was your what was um, your what sort of what happened in that fight? It, it's a slip up. I, my first my first fight as a pro, I boxed Paul, Paul Bonson, proper journeyman, one of the best. Uh, don't get hurt, don't get wobbled. I wobbled him a couple of times, but I couldn't get that second shot in him. Uh, you know, I, I sort of learnt. You know, not everyone will go over. They, they will go over, but we've got, to, we've got to work a little bit more. So my second fight, I boxed a boy called Mark Williams. Um, I was 19. Yeah, I think he had 12 fights. He looked, he looked like an Adonis god. And I, I literally, something switched in my head. I was so pissed off. I went on points the last time out. I come out fucking flying. Uh, I knocked him out 35 seconds. Then I boxed a boy called Nigel Rafferty. Uh, I think he had 100 fights. Didn't, didn't win loads, proper journeyman. They didn't get stopped, didn't get hurt. Uh, I stopped him in the third body shot. I remember seeing him years later. His head gave me my fucking ribs back. Um, <laughs> and then, then they then, then they signed me to fight a boy called uh, Lee Swaby. Uh, Lee Swaby at the time, I think he was a world champion kickboxer. He's very experienced. Uh, to be honest, looking back, I, I had no right being in there with him, but he's, I still should have done better than what I did. And... I was sort of living the life. It was people coming on to me. It was the next big thing. And, you know, I, I was going to town quite a bit. And there's a picture of me the night before the fight in town. I wasn't drinking, but I was just in town. You know, it was a, and I come out for two rounds. I fucking battered him. I absolutely battered him. Come out the third round, I was gone. I had nothing left at all. It was the first time ever in my life I was drained. Um, I basically shot my lord in two rounds. I had fuck all left. <laughs> Pre- premature Jack later <laughs> so, and I, I just walked onto a shot uh, and I walked onto a shot and I went down uh, I went back to my mates I, so I had some good mates uh, went back went back to the house um, let, let a couple of spliffs up uh, <laughs> wash, drank, drank a bit of vodka but I just didn't talk to anyone I just didn't talk to anyone I was trying to keep me happy and talk to me and it sort of switched in my head you know I, I knew I shouldn't have shouldn't have lost. I knew it was my downfall. Take nothing away from him. He caught me with a shot. He threw the shot. It's not a lucky shot. Um, so I knew things had to change. So the next morning, I phoned Di Gardner, who was my manager at the time, and we were with this company called uh, Just Players, who sort of gave me uh, a bit of sponsorship, helped me out with things, got me a car, uh, and they they were sort of. New, new to the promotional game and they were trying to get me a bit too quick on what I should have been. And I remember speaking to Dai Garden the next day and I said, Dai, I should never have lost and all that. And Dai was going mad. He said, Enzo, he said, I told him, I told him, he should never have been in a fucking six rounder in the fourth fight. He should never have been in a fucking six rounder. It should have been a four rounder. And I just stopped him there and then. I said, Dai, it was only a four rounder and I got caught in the fucking third. So I said, it wouldn't have made a, it wouldn't have made a difference what rounds it was. <laughs> Uh, but I said things have got to change, uh, uh, and I knew then and then. So at that point, you then went through like a period of domination of your career because you went unbeaten for so long. Mm. But during that period, you became world champion. So did you? Was that a bit surreal for you, or did you always know you were going to reach that point? Um, I, I sort of knew, and I didn't. I think that the first, the first, it, it started. I think it was a, it was a couple of fights. Uh, I had for Frank Warren. Um, he, he was giving me a bit of chance. We tried to go with someone else. So uh, he, he fought a guy. I fought a guy called Eamon Glennon, uh, who, who, who suddenly passed, sadly me passed away a couple of years ago from Blackpool. And um, he just he just boxed uh, heavyweight. I can't remember the heavyweight name, but he boxed heavyweight and went and punched him. 
And I'd given away a couple of stone. I'd gone in there uh, and I, I'd knocked him out in two rounds. Then I have a phone call on a Saturday. Enzo, do you want to fight? It's, it's a good story. It's, do you want to fight Tuesday? Um, I don't know if you remember Ernie Fossey. Um, Frank Warren's right now, man. Top guy. Didn't, didn't give a fuck. He, he's as straight <laughs> as they come. He phones me up on a Monday, on a Saturday night. He said, do you want to fight Tuesday? You're cool. Um, it was on a it was on a Eugene Maloney boxing show, Frank, Frank or Kelly's uh, brother, <laughs> sister, or whatever. <laughs> so I said, "Yeah." I said, "Who am I fighting?" He said, "Simon James." I said, "Yeah." I, I didn't care. I was one of them. I didn't ask. I didn't really ask. I didn't, didn't have box rec and YouTube and all them days, so just didn't really didn't care. He said, uh, "You got a decent enough record." He said, "But he's not much good." Um, he said, "He's but bow your weight." A little bit heavier, so I said, "Yeah, fine." So in end days, we had to travel to York Hall. We didn't have a didn't have a sat nav, so we had to go out on a computer print out. So it was like a it was like a three and a half hour trip. Took it took about seven hours, uh, all, all in a little car. <laughs> Guess there, and I'm looking around and I'm thinking, I said, "I can't see no guy. I can't see no guy wrong about my weight." It's a couple of big fellas, but I can't see nothing wrong with it. So I said, "Ernie," he said, "Damn," I said, "Where's this? Where's this Simon James?" He said, oh, Simon James. I said, the boy you tell me I fight then? He said, oh, James Gilbert, he said. He said, him over there. So he pointed over this big black fella. He must have been 1710. He was the, he was the heavyweight champion of Zimbabwe. He had, he had eight fights, eight wins, eight knockouts. I said, oh, cheers, in. We get in a, we get in a ring now, and I, I'm not normally cautious. You've seen me fight. I don't, I don't have no fear. I never have. But I obviously, I come out a bit cautious. And about... A minute and a half, or a minute and a half, two minutes into the into the round, I tell a light. It was thirty seconds before the end of the first round. He hit me with the right hand, and he came out with the left arm. And I remember blocking, and I thought, "Fuck, there's some power in there." So he start. He unloaded about twenty shots. You no, know, like um, Jake Paul had done against Floyd. He unloaded about twenty shots. I'm blocking like that, and th- just tuck it up. After he threw his last shot, he sort of stepped back, and he went. <sighs> And it, it, if I had the video, you would see me sort of looking at the camera going, You've got to go the second round. He tried to start quick. I just banged him with a left up. Uh, <laughs> d- down he went, he got up. Down he went again. Uh, that was the end of the story. Who, so, who hit harder? Uh, him or the big 23 stone fella? Oh, the big 23 stone fella. Da- big Daz Morgan. Uh, he boxed, <laughs> boxed my dad. Like you said, he had, he had nine fights. He won a Four Nations gold medal with the quickest knockout in Four Nations history. As a pro, he gave hell to Derek Chisora, Martin Rogan. He even went off to Ireland, sparring Martin Rogan, and become, they become good friends. And he, he gave him hell, but he never trained. Good. And it, it, was, it was always a pity. He could have been so good. Sam Sexton, uh, he yeah, gave him a nightmare yeah. tool. Derek oh, Chisora, he gave him a nightmare tool. Rogan, he gave him a nightmare tool. He was in a couple of the prize fighters. Um, just never trained. Uh, but he ferocious punch power and speed as well and it, it was it was mad because he was brilliant on a skateboard 23 stone what? 23 stone brilliant on a skateboard you bothering us <laughs> he, he was he was just an old considering he was out of shape and how he looked he was an athlete uh i spoke i spoke i don't know if we follow rugby but i know i know the jones brothers from wales and he used to play rugby with them and they said he, he could have been something special, just, just wouldn't fucking listen. And it, it's a pity because he won that Four Nations gold. He could have gone on the bigger things and just didn't drink. But he I'll definitely hit the harder. I'll tell you what, you'll never see big rogues on a skateboard. <laughs> no, <laughs> <definitely not. laughs> but I remember, I remember him phoning me one night. He said, I've been sparring. He said, and someone's just uh, robbed Rogie's sister's car. So they went out looking for the car. And it was like a blockade of police. He said, he's texting me in the car. He said, I fucking shit in myself. He said, <laughs> 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 he's not big rookie, like, he actually is the hardest man in Belfast. Like, uh, uh, he's a good boy, Martin, as well. Yeah, yeah, he's an absolute gentleman. He's a man of the people, like, he's he's really well thought of here. You, yeah, you, he's a good lad. Yeah, you, you went on then to fight the cruiserweight great in David Hay. What was, what was that whole experience like? Because that was when... Obviously, David Hay was well. We all know him now as like a king of cruiserweights, like, and he was he was unbelievable. What was that experience? Right, it was. It was at the time I feared no one. Right, I feared no one, and it, people always ask me what what what's the fight that eats you most, and that's the fight that eats me eats me most. Not not because of the loss, I, I wouldn't do enough. Um, 
I went to see Frank Warren. He said, um, you got to fight David Hay and all that. I said, yeah. She told me the money. I said, yeah. Now, looking back, I could have said, no, I do want to. I do an extra 150, an extra 200 like Dave and I had. No, nah, I'm not like that. I'll fight. That's so all I wanted to do was fight him. Um, I knew what I was up against. I knew how good he was. Um, and I, I trained like a fucking demon. I trained like a demon. I was always a small cruiser. I know he come down from everywhere, but I was, always, I was always a small cruiser. But I trained like a fucking demon. And the week before the fight, uh, I jumped on a scale and I weighed 14 stone four. And I, I was that was perfect for me because I was always about 14. Well, I was always under 14. But 14 four, I was solid, I was strong. Uh, then we had the week of the press conference. We had the press conference. I went up to London on a Monday. Why, I don't know. But I travelled all the way back to Swansea the same day. Um, I think my, ki- my kids were bad, so I wanted to be around them. About two days later, I'm sitting in my house, three, day, three days out from the fight. I'm fucking laying in the bed. The room starts spinning. Uh, I run upstairs. I fucking spew everywhere. I shit everywhere. Uh, cut the really short. I caught gas around the right desk. Uh, I get to the fight. I get to the show. The weigh-in, even. I guess the weigh-in. If you watch the scales and the weigh-in, I'm on the scales. Bear in mind, I was 14 for a week before. I had no weight to cut. I was strong. I was solid. Uh, I had a pair of tracksuit bottoms on. I think I had trainers on. I had two phones in my pocket. Two sets of keys. Frank Warren's wallet. So I was, that was a... I, was, <laughs> um, and I, I, weigh, I think I weighed 13.10. That's all I weighed. With all that on. Um, I think on the night they weighed us again, I weighed 13.6. Uh, and just... Just everything went wrong for me. I remember, I remember the thing in the paper of the day of uh, Ends was a big Cardiff City fan. Uh, Cardiff City's fucking Swansea's rivals. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you know, I, I got people phoning me. What, what sort of fuck? I don't know, like. Right? But so, <laughs> so, and you know, I, I run to the ring that night because I just tried to get myself up. I, I never, I was never scared of him. I, I knew I was up against, but nothing ever scared me. You know, I, I'm surprised. I'm surprised I took some of the shots I did in the first round because. I was I was weak as a kitten, but you know when I when I make excuses, I think it's a valid excuse. I was you know a lot of people want to go to work that day and my fucking yeah. staying in the ring with the most most exposed feathers. But looking back, people always say, "What would you have done differently?" What I would have done differently was fight on a different night. I should have. Mm-hmm. Certain people knew I was ill. Frank Warren didn't. I will be honest. He, he would have pulled it. Uh, certain people knew I was ill. I wasn't gonna come out and, and I, was, I was sort of young and dumb. I had this, I had this macho image. You know, I'm not gonna pull out. The, I'm not gonna pull out the fuck all. No one, no one's scared of me. Uh, so people, in hindsight, people should have pulled me out, but I didn't. So I'd like to have fought on a different night. Would I have beat him on a different night? I don't know. You know, I, I, I do rate him. I think he was that good. Uh, would have I had a much better chance? Hundred uh, percent. And that, that's, that's the one. Who, is a is a couple actually. Yeah, that's that's one of them. For sure, that's that's such a good point. I've I've thought about that a lot in terms of if you get sick, you know, you wouldn't go to work, you wouldn't you wouldn't leave, you wouldn't leave bed, and no. in any other sport, even it would be more acceptable. But it seems like with fighting, you just can't pull out. Like even it's people, stupidity, absolute stupidity. We're looking back on it now, uh, especially me being a trainer now as well as the young fighters. Uh, just absolute stupidity and. There's no, nothing brave about it. Uh, you know, looking back and thinking, oh, I'm brave. I'm, I'm still stepping in the ring. Um, the money was good. Yeah, great. Uh, but just absolutely stupid. I put my put my health on the line, put my life on the line. Um, you know, when you say you put your life on the line, people don't realise how close it could have been uh, for someone who's so ill uh, and going through with that fight the way I did. It, it, it was sort of lucky, lucky nothing worse happened. Was there any talk of a rematch or anything, Enzo? No, I was. I think that was one of the other reasons why I took it because I, I knew he was struggling for the weight, and I knew I knew he would do the weight right. Um, I knew Adam Booth's uh, very very strict with the science of the, the weight cut and things like that. And I think that was the last time I knew he could have made cruiser. Uh, so I think that that could have been one of the other reasons why I, I actually went through with the fight. And again, like I said. Just total stupidity. Yeah. Speaking speaking there of uh, you were saying like you, you train fighters now. You were lucky to be trained by the, the great Enzo Kalzaki. 
who's now become sort of like a folklore hero in the sport of boxing. Uh, he famously never boxed himself. What was it like being coach, coached by someone who, who didn't box himself but became such like a legendary coach? Um, it, was after, it was after my first fight with Mark Hobson. Um, I was with Nicky Pipe, his old trainer. Uh, and I went in, I, I, I totally underestimated Mark Hobson. He was a British and Commonwealth champion. Uh, I remember, I remember seeing it, seeing him at the weigh-in. He, he was like, ah, he's like a bean pole. Uh, obviously, I didn't know nothing about cutting weight that much because I just never had to cut weight. And I remember my brother phoning me, and I my brother saying, "Oh, what's what's he what's he like?" I said, oh, "I'm gonna snap him in half." I said, he's, he's, uh, "He's like a rake." I said, "I'm gonna rip it, rip his body in half." Comes to a fight, and looks in the ring, and I'm thinking, "Fucking hell, that's not the same guy who weighed in yesterday. He he was just huge." And I just totally underestimated. And it was a it was a tough tough fight, um, and I needed a change. And I, I thought to myself, where can I go? Uh, I was a bit good friends with Joe, um, so I decided to, to give Enzo give Enzo a try. And you know, I I'm always I like to push myself to the limits. I like to give everything I got. So I knew his sort of type of training would appeal to me because I've seen him with the Amsterdam and the young guy growing up with Gavin Reese, Bradley Price, Byron Price, Delroy Price and I knew he would appeal to me but we got I got to the gym the first day done the training and I remember driving home my brother phoned me he said that how did it go? I said well easy I said I'm quite shocked to be honest I said quite easy he said oh, I thought he would have struggled he said no right like, but I said no easy so we went there the next day Coming home, I had to pull the car over. I had to pull over the hard shoulder. I couldn't focus on the road. I was wrecked. <laughs> so that that was uh, that was the start of um, just just mad training sessions. He just done. You no, know, you see fighters, newer fighters doing three, four times a day training. Sometimes we only train once. Most of the time we only train once, but we done it all in one go. We do the six, like me and Joe, for example, we do do a six mile run. Come back to the gym, we do 12 rounds sparring straight off a six mile run. I do six on the bags, he do six on the pads. Then we swap over. Then he take us outside on the rugby fields doing sprints and burpees and whatever. And it was just absolutely ridiculous. And it was like, I, I remember when I, when I won my world title, um, I was fighting Marcello Dominguez, one of the, the hardest men in world boxing at the time. He literally had the reputation of the hardest chin in world boxing. Two days before the fight, when he was supposed to be tapering down, I done twelve four minute rounds on the pads. And I talked about hundreds, hundred and twenty punches per round. He made me work. Then he took me outside. I had to do ten sprints up and back of rugby field, twenty burpees, ten sets. If you watch the fight, as I'm walking in the ring, I'm struggling to get up the steps. My legs are in pieces, but I just never ever run out of steam. Then, so you he didn't go easy on you for having the same name, though. No. No, he was worse. <laughs> but as it happens, he probably he probably treated me like a second son. Yeah. You know, I'd, yeah, I'd, I'd yeah. have to him after. Um, he, he was he was just he was just funny. He was he just didn't didn't care. Uh, what he thought of him, he just didn't care. I remember once, uh, I think I was sparring Joe for HBO. I think he was fighting Hopkins, so I was sparring Joe for the HBO show. Uh, and before before the HBO come, he said that. Uh, he said he called him in for a, in, in the little office he had. He had a fridge and he had a kettle. And he said, "Do you want a, you want a cup of tea or a coffee?" And they all said, "Oh, we'll have a coffee." And they're outside. So he goes in the fridge and he pulls this milk out, and the milk must have been there for about four weeks. <laughs> oh, <laughs> so he sort of, he sort of oh, no. puts it in the cup and it, it plops in. <laughs> oh. I said, "Who you, you can't you can't give him that?" He said, "Yeah, fuck him." He said. <laughs> <laughs> So they, they, they are, they're drinking their coffee, they're drinking their tea, and you and you can see them. They they, they don't want to say nothing, but it, it must it must have been absolutely stunned as well. Like. Oh my god! Like, like. His methods of training. Do you take that into your your own sort of uh, style as a trainer now, or do you just take bits off everyone? No, I I had I had sort of his style anyway. I sort of. Um, like I, boys, I'm, I've been coaching for years. I lost my brother. I lost my father. I think eight years ago now. Um, uh, so I took over. I used to help before then, anyway. But I sort of took over. Me and my brother took over. Uh, then I lost my brother uh, 
2020. Uh, so he was my co-trainer, so and I just carried. I was going to give it up. I will be honest. It was just too high. Mm-hmm. So many boys. Um, I got about sixty boys in the gym, and so like a little tin shack, and I was going to give it up. But then uh, a friend of mine, Luke, used to fight for me at Super Heavyweight. He he joined with me, and helped me, and uh, we went on. We went on a run. I think we had before all the lockdown started. I think we had something like forty-five fights. We only lost four, and uh, all my boys are super fit. We all give weight. They all give weight away. They all give fight away. Um, they sort of it's hard to get on fights really. not not because they're better than anyone else it's because they they so fit so strong uh, you know I, I've had boys with five fights boxing boys with 100 fights and winning just and what, what I say to the boys in the gym give me your best that's all I care about yeah. whether it's in the ring whether it's in the fight whether it's in training give me your best that's, that's all I care about the only way I'll accept the loss if the boy is better than him you can't can't do any more. You have got a massive hug of me. You give try your best. He's not going to be fitter than you. He can't be stronger than you. He can't have more desire than you. But if he's better than you, that's the only way I'll, I'll accept the loss. So all my boys are super fit, and people people think I rule with an iron fist, and I don't. I completely don't. It's just just full of banter up the gym. But, you know, you sort of I keep them. I keep them like a little family. It's like uh, when one of the boys fights, I make sure. Everyone turns up to watch them fighting. If they haven't turned up to watch them fighting, they better have a good reason not to turn them up fighting. So it's sort of sort of like a little family. And to be to be honest, it, it costs me money to keep the gym open half, half the time. Yeah. But I enjoy I enjoy doing it. Yeah. But tell me this: is it safe to have a cup of coffee up there? <laughs> yeah, we haven't got a kettle, so yeah. <laughs> it's, a, it's a cost of down the road. <laughs> and so obviously we need to touch on this, and I know you get probably asked it all the time, but you shared the ring with one of the greatest to ever do it in terms of Roy Jones. You knocked him out, obviously. Was there a point whenever you were standing across the ring from him that it was like a pinch me moment where you were like, I can't believe this is happening or was it just like... No, to, to be honest, right, I thought I thought Roy Jones could have been the GOAT. Uh, I, I, I thought he was amazing, but he, he was never my idol. He, he was never my idol. And I went to watch... Um, I went to watch Joe in Vegas... And Roy was there, and I, not for me, but I asked him for a photo, for to have a photo with me for one of my one of my mates, James Boxes, for me, to just just send him a photo, just just for him, and he blanked me. So you know, I don't know what it was. I, I don't think he's that type, but he he blanked me. So Frank Warren phoned me. He said, "Oh, I got an opportunity to fight Roy Jones." I said, "Yeah." He says in Russia. Like, yeah, no problem. So I've been in Russia before. I've won a European title, first round knockout. Uh, how I'm still alive, I don't know, but I done it. Uh, I got out, and we we went there. We went. Me and Richard Maynard, um, who was Frank's press guy, we went over. I think it was five weeks before um, to do a to do a, a press conference, and the, the timing of the flights were terrible. So it works out at the press conference, uh, like. Eight in the morning when you, you get there, like it would have been about four in the morning our time and stuff like that. So I, I, I was wrecked. It looked, it looked like I was drunk on the table. I was so sleep, sleep deprivated. Uh, it looked like I was drunk on the table. So we done, we done the, we done the press conference. Then we had to get taken to the arena. So we wait outside for the to the lifts to come, and this Rolls Royce comes up, picks Roy up, takes him to the arena. I kid you not now, and I swear, you're going to think I'm joking, right? A three-wheeler turned up to take me to the arena. (laughs) 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 I think think I I put on my Twitter at the time, I said, this is what they come to get me. But I'm one of them, doesn't bother me in the slightest. Uh, Guess the arena, all the press come in, no no one bothered with me at all. No one actually bothered with me. Uh, And... I was just happy to be there. So we went there then, um, a week before the fight. Uh, Gary Lotter couldn't come. He had a boy fighting. So Alex Hughes, who boxes for Gary, he came over with me. Um, a good story about him in a minute now. And we had to do the press conference. Uh, we done the press conference, then we had to do the, the public workout. Now, Gary's my Gary's my trainer, my pad man. Uh, never done nothing with Alex before, so... We had to go to the gym in the morning and we do a little pad to see how we work together. So otherwise, it'd look a bit stupid. 
and we clicked straight away. So we went, we went to the press conference, and I started it in the pads. And I not, well, I not, I not bigging myself up with bragging, but when I hit the pads, it sort of it reverberates from the place. And I think with the, with the speed I can throw them at, and the shots I would throw in, it was reverberating. I think that I think the penny dropped then. I think the penny dropped that you know he hasn't come here to lose because so that's that's what I was. That's what they picked me for. I was an ex world champion. I unboxed for a year. I unboxed a cruiserweight for a year or two years. Uh, so I, I was picked to make him look good. He was on an eight fight winning streak. Um, he looked in great shape and wouldn't surprise me if he was juiced. I don't know, but he'd <laughs> never know. But Russia, Russia, and all that. Yeah. Uh, so uh, and I, the penny started to drop then and. We get the press, we get the way in, and they call me on the way in, and we were just laughing because we had, they had the, the Russian Michael Buffer, he was just the, the, the carbon copy of Michael Buffer, the Russian. And so, you guess, eh, we, we done the way in, we shook hands, and when we shook hands, he tried to pull me towards me, he was trying to pull my, me towards him, and I pulled him towards me, I'm physically strong, he pulled him towards me, and I, I said, Look, it, it's an honor and a privilege to share a ring with you tomorrow. I said, But You've made a mistake. I am going to knock you out. And he laughed. He said, I'll knock you out. I said, no, trust me. I'll knock you out. So we get the day of the fight. And the boys were fighting earlier. It was a couple of boys, Alex Hughes and... Not Alex, did Alex fight? No, Liam Williams and Zach Davis, I think, fought. Or, or some, some, one of them fought, or two of them fought. So they had to go early. I decided to go a bit later on my own. So they took me later on my own. And I beat the arena twice before. And he took me up, up this industrial site, up this industrial track. And I swear to God, I just imagine him pulling me over the corner. Some guys coming out with guns saying, like, you go down to the third. <laughs> 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 so we, we, get, we, guess, we guess the arena, um, finally, <laughs> after two hours. And it was all water, water in our changing room. Uh, and all the water was open. So we went and bought our own water. I wasn't, I wasn't messing around with nothing. So we guess, we guess uh, they said they come in. They said that oh oh another another story here before before I uh, get into it. I had to have special gloves made by Adidas because I I broke my hand. I, I didn't break my hand. I bust my hand about four weeks before. I had to have special gloves, extra padding, um, to protect my hand. The night before the fight, uh, Russ Amber, he's uh, he's the owner rival. He was down in the, the lobby with Gary Lockett. The cop so, man, Russ Amber, is that who you're talking yeah, about? Yeah, yeah. He, he, okay. he actually owned rival. Yeah. So he, Gary said, Lock ends. He phones me up. He said, You better cut, you better come downstairs. I said, Oh, he said, You've got to try these gloves on. I said, Gary, I got my gloves. I don't need gloves. He said, Enzo, come down and try these gloves on. I said, Gary, you know I need gloves. I said, Gary, I got to have my own gloves. He said, Enzo, just get down here now and try these gloves on. So I got downstairs, I put these rival gloves on and I put them on and I sort of went like that and I looked at Gary and went, yeah, they do. So as I'm walking upstairs, they, they, were, they were tiny, right? they were tiny gloves. I remember Gary, I had a text and I was off, Gary, silly fuckers when they need to wear them gloves. I saw, I saw all the text was, they were tiny. So we guess arena, they called me now, they said, look, you're in the ring five minutes. I said, right, so we warmed up and sweat and ready. It was a, it was a nice arena. So they take me out to the, the back, the back uh, alley. So it goes right round the outside. Why they took me outside, I never know. They took me outside. And I had to wait in the foyer. They thought it was freezing cold. So they obviously thought I was, they were going to piss me off and cool me down. I started punching the walls. and Not not I just, you know, flicking the walls, keep myself active and stuff like that. And then they called me into the ring. So this is about 45 minutes now from when they called me. I've been stuck in this lobby. So they, they started the premium with bagpipes, right? <laughs> I don't know why bagpipes, right? So I'd done the bagpipes, guess the ring, my song won't back down, come on. Guess the ring. I had to wait another 10 minutes for him to come in the ring. Then they had to do the, the national anthems. They played God Save the Queen for me, and I'm like, that's, that's not my anthem. So mm -hmm. they, they played God Save the Queen. So guess the fight, guess the fight. Straight away, I put it on him. I thought, I'm not going to get it. I, I, you know, I'm still, I'm still shocked how fast he was, uh, and the, the cute little moves he had, uh, which I probably subliminally studied over the years. Little tap, tap left up the head, tap left up the body. Tried out of me, he didn't catch me, so I done it back and I caught him, um, and I just put it on him. 
then I hurt them, and then I knocked them out. And as as I knocked them out, the old place went completely dead silent, absolutely dead silent. And one of the boys actually went, "Yes!" And I turned to Zach and went, <laughs> "So Zach sat down. So I sat in the corner, uh, and I, I sat in the edge to show him the sign across. Uh, and people always say, "Did he do actually with Roy Jones?" I said, "No, I done that from when I was a kid." When I knocked people out as a kid, I, I still do that. So as I'm sitting there, now, obviously I'm worried about, I'm worried about Roy Jones. He's, he's not moving. I'm sort of panicking a little bit now. Next thing I see this hand coming into the ring. Have you seen the film Blood Sport? Yeah. Like, you, know, you know the little Chinese guy. Yeah, yeah, gold, yeah, yeah. He's got the gold top. <laughs> so the hand comes in and it's this Alex Hughes. She's got. He robs Roy Jones's gum shield. <laughs> No way. So, so Alex, Alex has got Roy Jones's gum shield. Oh, still my it. God. So um, Roy comes round, I go over to see him. Um, and yeah, great. Walks back to change room, loads of people wanted photos. Uh, and I had photos of everyone. Guess, guess the change room. I don't know. Have you heard any of the stories of the aftermath? No. Oh, and lightness. Right, it was... I mean, I'm in the changing room now, and we're in the changing room, and uh, have you seen a film show down in Little Tokyo, old film? No. no. There's one of the stars there, Chinese guy, he come, he was there, he comes in the ring, he comes to meet you, says hello, well, brilliant, well done. Next thing, it's this biker gang uh, called the Night Wolves, and they've been great to me the entire week. Big, big fellas, uh, the Vladimir Putin's um, gang. So, we're in the changing room now. One of them comes in. He says, "You come with us now." And I'm like, "No." He said, "Come with us now." And I said, "No." So there's this kid in there, and he's got he's got a camera, a TV camera, and it was um, they were under 50, 200 grand. So they just push him out of the way to get to me, uh, and, and the camera just smashes on the floor. So he says, "Look, come with us now." And I'm done. All right then. At this moment in time, Liam Williams now. And so he smashes the bottle behind his back. He's thinking, if Enzo's in, I'm in. And, oh and, and Alex, who, Alex Hughes has gone, I think I'll wait outside, he said. <laughs> he should have been sticking his fucking gum shield in. And <laughs> <laughs> so, so we've, up, we've walked up this alley now, and it, it must must have been ages. And I, I'm, I, the one, there's about four of them. The big guys, right? The big guys do a lot of charity work. I don't know what else to do. I'm not asking, right? So... <laughs> I'm walking up, and I'm watching this guy, and I'm asking him, I said, what they want? He said, um, uh, nothing, I don't know. I said, you do know. I said, what they want? Now, I'm looking at him, and I'm thinking to myself, he puts his hand in his pocket, now to pull a gun or a knife or something. I'm going to bang him, and I'm going to run. <laughs> Where am I going to run? So I don't know, but that's my instinct. I'm going to bang him and run. So we get in the Roy's changing room. Goes to Roy's changing room. I go over to see Roy, and Francis Wall and Frank Sun's with me. And... They'd have an argument in the corner. I, I'm trying to stay out of that. I'm trying to suck up the Roy and show him friends and all that and <laughs> leave me Francis in there. Right? So yeah. what, what what I can gather is Roy had been looking so good in training. Uh, he'd been sparring a couple of top-level boys. He was hammering them. Uh, apparently, I, I had nothing left. I was nowhere near. I just had the name. Apparently, I was supposed to take a dive. What? Yeah, no yeah exactly. So Francis Warren, basically brilliant, as nervous and shitting himself as he must have been. Oh my god. He said, look. Oh, I don't know if it was a dive or it was a fact of it was hundred percent sure Roy's winning this fight. Yeah. And Francis told him, look, he said, look, did I look like a man who was supposed to lose? He said, You've seen him at the public workout, you've seen what he was like, you've seen the way he started the fight. He said, that is the man in himself. That's the way he fights. That's the way he always fights. He said, I don't bring people over the roof. So it was great. It was great. It was sorted out. Goes back to our hotel. And because what this promoter had done to us now, because put us through fucking hell, all the boys started buying champagne and beer off his account. <laughs> <laughs> so I had, I had one beer. I thought to myself, if they come back... I'm gonna go. I'd be, I'd be ready. So Alex Hughes and Zach now youngsters. 
Um, Dave, Dave on the champagne and Alex on the champagne and the cheesecake. He's, he's drinking the champagne, he's eating the cheesecake. And I say to Gary, I said, Gah, you'll have to watch him now. He, he said, he's hammered. So Francis Warren now, I've rebooked our flights. We were supposed to leave Sunday evening at five. Uh, he rebooked it for Sunday morning at five o'clock. I ended up watching Conor McGregor knock out Jose Aldo in the airport. <laughs> so it, it, was, it was the same time. And they, they, he's steaming. Alex is steaming. Now he's fallen asleep. He's fallen asleep for five minutes on set. And our car comes and it, a limo turns up. So we're in the limo and I'm in the front, I, in the front two seats on my own. Then we had Alex and Zach behind me, then we had Liam Williams, Gary Lockett, and Francis Warren. So about 20 minutes into the into the drive, I I hear uh, I hear uh, a bit of gurgling at the back. Yeah. Uh, uh, uh. Next thing I hear. Uh, uh. <laughs> 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 So next thing we got Alex, we got Zach who's next to Alex, who's just as pissed he's gone. Alex man, my jeans. <laughs> so I said, Alex man, I said, spewing this. I give him a plastic bag. Oh, thanks, Ed. So he spews in the bag. And he's so drunk, he chucks the bag behind him, right? Oh my <laughs> god. Right? Oh. So we pull it, we pull it into the airport. And it, it was that much, right? You could hear it swishing across the floor. Oh, 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 we were laughing. It was, it was on the roof. It was on the roof ceiling of the car. Oh. Gone. So we guess out there. You had this little Russian driver. Like, <laughs> and Alex, yeah, in his Welsh, his Welsh accent. Oh, sorry, drive. I <laughs> <laughs> guess, in the, guess in the airport. I said, Alex. I said, you're going to have to change your clothes. You're going to have to change your clothes. But you're not going to let you on the plane. Oh, how do I change? He's absolutely hammered, right? He's absolutely hammered. You know, young star. He's going to look after him. I want to leave him. He said, um, I said, you have to change your clothes. I said, how am I going to do that? I said, well, open your case, get some clothes, go behind that big fucking pillar there and change your clothes. Oh, all right, then. It's all right. So next thing, the security noticed me from the night before. Oh, Enzo, Mac and Ellie, Mac and photo, photos. We have photos like that. And Alex is getting changed. So I turn around after our photos. Alex is in the middle of Moscow Airport in a pair of fucking Batman boxer shorts. <laughs> <laughs> getting changed. <coughs> we finally get him through customs and all that. They, they let us through. They, they love me, do you? They let us through. So the, this head of the biker gang now phones Francis Warren. And his, name is, like... his name is the surgeon. <laughs> I'm not asking, I'm not telling, that you make me want my up, I don't care. So he's telling Francis, he said, he said, look, no matter what happened, he said, the Russian public loved Enzo. Uh, we'd love him to come back over here. He had time with everyone. They loved him at the press con. I remember giving my talk. It's how bad some Russian past Russian. I give him a, a talk, one of my training talks this Russian. He started crying in front of me. It was just so pleased to have it. It was just so affectionate out there and stuff like that. And they said we loved him. They loved him. We'd let, I'd love to have him over here again uh, to box again. We'd pay him the same money. So Francis Warren's on the phone now. He's looking at me, dot pound signs in his eyes like that, and I'm like that. <laughs> <laughs> so that's my story in Russia. <laughs> Tell you what, that's that, a, fighting uh, Roy Jones sounds like the most fucking. I know. Or a fan and stressful experience of all time. My take is the moral of the story is you don't re you don't reject Enzo for a photo you're getting sparked out. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and don't get caught in Moscow or important Batman boxers. Oh man, he's I hope we I'll give his tag names. You can tag him in after that. Yeah, we'll, we'll definitely <laughs> tag Honest him to God, right? Honest to God, one of the most talented kids we've ever seen. He's about to finish early for an eye injury. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely brilliant kid. And the funniest drunk you've ever seen me like. <laughs> I, I, we went, we went into the, we went to the airport. They had uh, Gary, Gary Lockett had uh, obviously scissors and stuff in his bag from things. So they go for the scanner, and they've they've seen the scissors, they've seen knives, uh, a knife for cutting tape and stuff like that. So they're op they're opening they're opening a bag. And Alex had chucked the plastic bag over Gary's stuff and the boy's stuff. 
So they're opening the bag. They don't even ask. As they open it, they pull the scissors. You can see the one go, oh, my God. Oh. <laughs> they just let him go. <laughs> oh, my God. Oh, my God. Early oh, and Brilliant really. still run the bike with a broken bottle. Oh, no. <laughs> he, he was there. What he would have done, I'd never know. I never <laughs> had it. Gary told me after the Alex asked him, oh, where, where do you think you're taking him, Gah? He said, they're going to feed him to the pigs, Al. <laughs> <laughs> and, so, and so we were already massive fans of you before you came on. And I'm an even bigger fan now. You're an absolute character yourself. Top man. See you guys. Yeah. Re- right. Really, really appreciate you coming if on. Then, it, I would get you on a game down the line sometime because I'm sure you yeah, probably... Yeah, really enjoyed, guys. Really enjoyed. Yeah. Thank, yeah. thank you so much, Enzo. Really, really appreciate it. No, Thanks, man. Thanks for having next time, Enzo, I'm going to get a few tins of beer for the next one. <laughs> <laughs> we'll do a sit down in your gym. In Wales, yeah, but well, I, I, I'm hoping to fight again. Um, yeah, I'm feeling good and feeling strong. I've been sparring. Um, I, Roy Jones again, maybe? No, no, I, I don't, I don't, I don't, I We can sort it out in Russia, like. so I, well, I did have an offer to go back to Russia and I did accept, but it, and so don't, up. and so don't. No, <laughs> you're, you're barred. I, I've been there twice, I've been there twice, I've not the start of twice. Why not go again? I don't. <laughs> I'm one of them. I don't care. I'll so, what, what's potentially next, Enzo? Then? Well, I, I, I got to a point where, when my brother died, I was suffering bad anxiety. I had a car crash a couple of days later. Nothing bad, but it popped my disc out of my back. So for a year and a half, I couldn't walk, and I generally could not walk. So in my mind, <clears throat> I thought to myself, I'm going to get myself in some sort of shape where I can fight again, and I'm literally in the best shape of my life, physically, uh, mentally. Uh, whether I can fight the same, I don't know. But I've been sparring. I feel good. Uh, my, my training times are better. And I, I, don't get me wrong, I'm not looking for a, a big run. I spoke to Jamie Conlon. Uh, I speak to Frank Warren. And, you know, I'm, I'm after a couple. Is is a, is a new arena opening in Swansea in the summer. It's like five, six hours. I'd like to... I'd like to do that at Christmas, maybe say to that. So if that's the case, boys, you come down, be my guests. Oh, uh, definitely. Been, and so one more question. Alex, Have man. you been sparring that big Scottish fella? <laughs> big Daz <Dazmore. laughs> <laughs> No. No, not yet. <laughs> and so you be Logan Paul. I reckon that'll be the next Paul. one. I, I put Logan Paul in a coma. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to clip that. Logan Paul's <laughs> going in a coma. Clip it. There you go. <laughs> but as it happens, I thought, I think, Lo- I think Logan... I can, I can, I can, I can take to him better than Jake. Oh yeah, I, yeah, can, definitely. I think after the fight, he said, you know, he let me survive, and he said, I'm sorry, it was a dick. It's a massive, it's biggest moment of my life. So he knows, and he was respectful. Jake, I can't stand. Oh yeah, me either. And he, he's pretty for a, for a novice. He's pretty decent. Yeah. For a novice, he's he's pretty decent, right? But. It's just hard. It's just hard to take to him when he's saying he's a professional boxer and he's knocking out the basketball player, uh, a UFC fighter, a, a multi-time MMA champion, but can't punch to save his life. Yeah, horrific. Uh, now he's got Tyron Woodley, who, who can bang with the right hand, but whether he can bang with, uh, I, t- I tell you, I tell you, a boy for him, my a good mate of mine. He trained over with John Kavanaugh and Conor McGregor, uh, John Phillips, so for good mate of mine. You know, there's there's some rule. Uh, <laughs> I was going to say hospitalise him, but that's a bit bad. I sort of put him out of his misery. You know, you know, he's 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 a UFC fighter, and and John John used to box with me, box my dad. I'm sure I'm sure uh, I'm sure he'd quite happily take up our challenge. There we go. We'll get that on your you and Logan Paul's undercard. We're going to sort that out. <laughs> <laughs> and so thanks a million for coming on. Really appreciate it, mate. Oh, I really Lovely enjoyed speaking to you. Absolutely. Thank you so much. A massive thank you goes to that prize guy who has also sponsored the podcast. That prize guy is a company who runs competitions daily on their Instagram and Facebook. They're based in Bangor in Northern Ireland and they have a range of prizes from Range Rovers to Rolex watches and even 20 grand in cash. If you check out their website at thatprizeguy.co.uk, you can enter any of their competitions there. And if you use our code BRAWL20, you'll get 20% off and free shipping. So thanks for the continued support, lads. It's much appreciated. As always, we're sponsored by Manscaped, which produce the highest quality male grooming products to people all over the world. Father's Day is coming up, folks. So 
why not get your dad a razor, nose trimmer, etc. And if you use our discount code BRAWBOXING, you'll get 20% off and free shipping. So please, everyone, get all over it. So guys, that's it for our episode with Enzo McRinelli. Join us again next week when we're back with a very special guest. Thanks. I'd like to call that white girl problem. Let her back in autumn. Every gift I try to get her, she already got him. Messing with the TA, wonder what she taught him. Work her way down, literally to the bottom. Where are all my best friends? I cannot ignore them. Never gonna text them. I